Whenever we get to different states in life, when we get to those big milestones in life, uh, a lot of times that is the moment when people start to give every piece of advice they can possibly give. So think about a, uh, a wedding couple. They're at their wedding, they've got a thousand different things going on, they're shaking hands, they're all excited, right? And it seems like every other person that comes up to the couple is going to say, hey, and the secret to a good marriage is fill in the blank. Don't go to bed angry. Make sure to say the two, the, the two three-word phrases, I love you and I am sorry, <laughs> right? Um, all of the, all, all the advice just seems to start pouring out there. Whenever a kid goes to his first day of school, I remember for me, my, one of the main pieces of advice that I had was make sure to befriend two groups of people. The cooks and the janitors. Because if, you are, if you're a little bit more hungry because you had like a full-on Super Bowl at recess, right? Whenever you come in and the cooks see you, if they like you, an extra chicken nugget just might make its way into your plate, you know? The janitors, they make sure that your room, that like the room is clean, but like if they find a, a, a new shiny pencil on the ground, they know just what desk to slip it in. Both of those things are very, very true in my life. I love St. Mary's because I was always friends with the cooks and the janitors. As a priest, as a young priest, I remember growing up, I remember like after I got ordained, it seemed like every older priest, whether they had been ordained for a year or for 30, right, every older priest seemed that they wanted to give a piece of advice. And I was like a sponge just soaking it up. And one of the, one of the things that I remember a priest telling me that I think was the most profound of anything was if you want to be, if you want to be a good pastor, if you want to be a good priest, Never ask somebody to do a job that you wouldn't do yourself. So if that means going plunge a toilet, do it. If that means painting a wall, do it. If that means laying floor, do it. But show that you're going to do any job that you're going to that you would you're willing to do any job that you would ask somebody else to do. See, I think in our life, I think in just in general in our life, that's a mark of humility. It's someone who's willing to do the, the rough job. But the fruit of it is always joy. Now what do I mean? Um, I, 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 have an, I, I watch a few different like, TV shows and stuff, and one of them that I've watched for a while has been uh, the show Hell's Kitchen. It's on Fox. It's a cooking show. And what happens is, is there's always a contest, and then the winning team gets sent off on like, some kind of awesome day. The losing team gets stuck back in the kitchen doing a less than pleasant job. They've either got to clean the house, they got to clean the building, or they got to, they got to like clean fish or something, just stuff that's just kind of gross, stuff that's usually just kind of hard, and stuff, quite honestly, that you want to complain about. And I remember watching the show, and it seems like every single week, somebody else is complaining during their punishment. See, that's not humility, that's being forced to, to do labor. True humility is doing the job of a janitor, of a cook, the, the, the less than pleasing job, right? It's doing the, that job, but having complete and total joy in it. So a fruit of humility is joy. And today, when we look at our gospel, we see that kind of spread throughout the day. In our gospel, we have, our first, we have Elizabeth, who's receiving Mary, and Mary is bringing the Christ child. At this point, it's right after the Annunciation. She's pregnant. She runs off to her, to her cousin's house, and she's going to go help her out. And there's a joy around that encounter. In our first reading, we hear about Bethlehem being the, the lowly, the small place. But from it, great joy is going to come out. So joy follows true humility. In our gospel today, whenever we're hearing this story, though, there's a little bit of Old Testament 
kind of parallelism that's going on. There's stuff in the Old Testament that speaks directly to our gospel today. In the Old Testament, all, of, all throughout the Jewish faith, all throughout the Hebrew life, like they were, they were struggling and waiting and waiting and waiting for the coming of the Messiah. In a way, they were in their own kind of advent for years and generations and generations, just waiting for the coming of the Messiah. Now they knew that the Messiah was going to come through the line of David. They knew that King David, it was going to be one of his descendants that was going to be that Messiah. And the encounter that we hear about today in the visitation of Mary and Elizabeth, this encounter, this back and forth between them, there's a lot of pieces in that story that point to that this is the fulfillment of David's line. King David, if you didn't know, was a great king. He had, he had a couple of sins that were very public. But what ended up happening is he was the one that brought the ark, the ark of the covenant, the presence of God for the Jewish people. He brought the ark of the covenant into Jerusalem. And he venerated the ark. He saw the ark as God's presence and was like very, very, he, he reverenced it with everything that he was, even though he was a king. It was kind of unheard of. Today in our New Test in our in the gospel in the New Testament, we hear that as as Mary takes as Mary goes, she goes with great haste. David, whenever he when he found out where the ark was, went with great haste. Mary would spend three months with Elizabeth. David spent three months in the presence of the ark. Mary, had, Mary, and her word, when she came into the presence of Elizabeth and said, like when she said, I'm here, when she was offered her greeting, the infant in Elizabeth's womb leaped for joy. David, as the ark was being brought in, danced with joy before the ark. See, there's a, in, in the Jewish Scriptures, there shows a fulfillment between what's going on at the visitation and what was going on with, with David, with King David, and recognizing the ark as the presence of God. If we see that, if we see the fulfillment that's happening, is that Elizabeth and John, in her womb, recognized the presence of God within Mary. They recognized it to the point that it brought a fulfillment to an Old Testament prophecy, but they recognized it in their own heart and they didn't get in the way. Like they let God be God. And they didn't try to get in the way of his action. John would grow up, as we heard earlier in, in Advent, John was a great prophet and could po point a lot of people and get his word out to a lot of people. But he never took the glory for himself. His life was always pointing to the true Messiah, his cousin, Jesus. They never got in the way. Elizabeth, same thing. She could have found a thousand reasons why she was an older woman, a barren woman, who never should have had a baby, and she, she could have walked around saying, look at my miracle child. But she didn't. She continued to point to Mary, who was also bearing a miracle child. I think in our lives, sometimes we can get in the way. Sometimes we step out of who we are before God and we try and step into the role of being God. There was a, uh, it, there's one of my favorite scenes in any movie ever. Uh, it was from the movie Rudy. And it's not whenever he's offsides and he tackles the guy because that was uh, wrong and we should just like, make fun of Notre Dame forever because of that. But... My favorite scene in the movie Rudy is whenever he's about like it's his last chance to get into Notre Dame. And it's his last moment and he's in the church and he's just praying. And a priest friend of his that he knows comes up to him and starts talking to him and just saying like, what's going on? I've been seeing you here a lot. And he says, man, 
It's the last chance. And if I don't get in now, I'll never get in. And all this time will be for a waste. And at one point, the priest looks at him and says, well, what are you going to do about it? And he says, maybe I haven't prayed enough. And he says, no, son, I think you've prayed plenty. He said, out of all the things that I've ever learned in my life as a priest, out of all the theology that I've ever studied, out of everything I've ever done, I've come to, the realiza- to two realizations in my life that are no question facts. He said, number one, there is a God. And number two, I'm not Him. I think in all of our lives, when we stand before God and we let God be God, when we stand before God as the Blessed Mother and receive from Him the graces, receive from Him the mission of our life, receive from Him the call of whatever He wants us to do, it's not that things go perfect, but it's according to His plan. That He gives the grace necessary to get through it. Now I know in our life, it's, it could sound like, man, like, Father, like, look, I, I understand that like, we need to pray and all, but like, I got real hard stuff in my life. Like losing a job, being sick, those kind of things are real. I think when we unite ourselves to the Lord, though, like the whole purpose of Christmas, the whole purpose of this time of preparation, the whole purpose of Jesus coming to begin with is so that God knows exactly what is going on in our lives. firsthand through experience. Like you feel abandoned? Well, Jesus knew something about that. Just look at Good Friday when everybody ran. You feel sick like you can't go anymore? Well, Jesus knew something about that as well. Maybe between the second and third time He fell under the weight of the cross. Man, I'm at a loss right now. Well, at the agony in the garden, the Lord knew everything that there was about being distant about being in darkness, about being away from every glimpse of of hope and of joy in his life. And he he sweat blood for it. See, Jesus comes into our life at Christmas not just so that we can experience the joy that we hear about in today's Gospel. But Jesus comes into our life at Christmas so that we can go somewhere with the hard stuff too. So if this year for Christmas, like if, if this period of time for you might not be an easy time, might not be a fun time, might be a time where you know what? It brings up a lot of hard memories. Or this year might have been a hard year. And a certain chair is empty for the first time. That's okay. Let us run to the Lord. Let us run to the source of all joy. Let us seek Him out and let Him in. Tell Him exactly what's going on. If we do that, we unite ourselves more to the mystery and the love and the abiding presence of God in our life. We let Him in deeper to new depths (laughs) beyond pain, beyond vulnerability, where we get to experience His love not just in the good, which is beautiful and amazing, but in the hard stuff as well. For all of us, the holidays brings a bunch of mixed emotions. The holidays brings a lot of wonderful, beautiful things in watching kids open presents. And that's amazing, and the Lord's there too. May this year, as we enter into this season of giving, this season of receiving, this season of exchanging gifts, let us exchange the first and most important gift of all, our praise to our Lord, and let Him enter into our own Christmas celebration. Amen.